There are efforts currently all over the country for new legislation with respect to gun rights. When the event announcement was distributed by us, we received several emails from people asking us where our organization stood on that issue. So I want to address that. I cannot imagine that our position can be better stated than by, than by our friend Alex Kaczynski, Chief Judge of the US, US Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, and himself a child of Holocaust survivors, in his dissent in Silveri, Eugene? Silvera. Silvera versus Lockyer, 2003. Judge Kaczynski writes, the majority falls prey to the delusion, popular in some circles, that ordinary people are too careless and stupid to own guns. And we would be far better off leaving all weapons in the hands of professionals on the government payroll. But the simple truth, born of experience, is that tyranny thrives best where government need not fear the wrath of an armed people. Our own sorry history bears this out. Disarmament was the tool of choice for subjugating both slaves and free blacks in the South. All too many of the, great, of the other great tragedies of history, Stalin's atrocities, the killing fields of Cambodia, the Holocaust, to name but a few, were perpetrated by armed troops against unarmed populations. Many could well have been avoided or mitigated had the perpetrators known that their intended victims were equipped with a rifle and 20 bullets apiece, as the Militia Act required here. If a few hundred Jewish fighters in the Warsaw Ghetto could hold off the Wehrmacht for almost a month with only a handful of weapons, six million Jews armed with rifles could not so easily have been herded into cattle cars. Continuing on with Judge Kaczynski's dissent, my excellent colleagues have forgotten these bitter lessons of history. This prospect of tyranny may not grab the headlines the way vivid stories of gun crime routinely do, but few saw the Third Reich coming until it was too late. The Second Amendment is a doomsday provision, one designed for those exceptionally rare circumstances where all other rights have failed, where the government refuses to stand for re-election and silences those who protest, where courts have lost the courage to oppose or can find no one to enforce their decrees. However improbable these contingencies may seem today, facing them unprepared is a mistake a free people get to make only once. Fortunately, the framers were wise enough to entrench the right of the people to keep and bear arms within our constitutional structure. The purpose and importance of that right was still fresh in their minds and they spelled it out clearly so that it would not be forgotten. Despite the panel's mighty struggle to erase these words, they remain, and the people themselves can read what they, plainly, what they say plainly enough. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. To be clear, this reflects the opinion of our organization, children of Jewish Holocaust survivors, and not necessarily those of our speakers. Both speakers tonight, Eugene Volokh and Adam Winkler, are professors at UCLA School of Law. Professor Volokh teaches free speech law, criminal law, tort law, religious freedom law, and church-state relations law. He has clerked for Justice Sandra Day O'Connor on the U.S. Supreme Court and for Judge Alex Kaczynski on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. He is the founder and co-author of the website The Volokh Conspiracy, to which I encourage you all to subscribe. He graduated from UCLA with a BS in math computer science at age 15. <laughs> Professor Volokh has previously spoken for us on the First Amendment with, with Judge Kaczynski, a very lively, informative, and entertaining evening. Professor Adam Winkler is a specialist in American constitutional law. His wide-ranging scholarship has touched upon a diverse array of topics such as the right to bear arms, corporate political speech rights, affirmative action, judicial independence, constitutional interpretation, corporate social responsibility, international economic sanctions, and campaign finance law. His work has been cited and quoted in landmark Supreme Court cases, including opinions dealing with the Second Amendment and with corporate political speech rights. Winkler was also part of the defense team that initially represented O.J. Simpson in the football player's infamous murder trial. This was more than enough to convince him to return to academia. <laughs>
I invite you to read more about the extensive and impressive background of our speakers in the handout for tonight's event. Professor Winkler's book, Gunfight, the Battle of the Right to Bear Arms in America, will be available for purchase and signing after our presentation tonight. I'm reading it right now, and I highly recommend it. Regardless of your position, you will enjoy the book, and you will learn a lot. Professor Volick and Professor Winkler will take questions following the presentation. Kindly turn off your cell phones and other electronic devices. And now I will turn the floor over to, to Eugene Volick and Adam Winkler. Professor Winkler will start. So um, the Second Amendment to the Constitution provides that uh, a well-regulated militia, comma, being necessary to the security of a free state, comma, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, comma, shall not be infringed. It's almost as if James Madison, the author of this provision, had just discovered this wonderful new thing, the comma, and wanted to put it in there as many times as possible. Uh, and ever since he did so, the language of the Second Amendment has confused generations of Americans. Uh, there have been two primary views of the Second Amendment. Uh, uh, on one hand, there have been those who thought that the Second Amendment uh, merely protects a right of state militias to operate free from federal interference. Um, and might be th thought of as a federalism provision, uh, restriction on the federal government's interference with state-run militias, something like the National Guard that we have uh, today. Uh, a competing view of the Second Amendment views it as an individual right to have guns for personal protection uh, and uh, also potentially for national defense. Um, in 2008, in a Supreme Court decision called District of Columbia against Heller, the Supreme Court held that the Second Amendment protects an individual right uh, for, to have a firearm in your home for self-defense. Uh, and in parsing the language of the amendment, the court emphasized that, um, that the Second Amendment had generally been construed by uh, state courts in the 1800s, uh, by uh, commentators in many years since as protecting an individual right to bear arms, and that that made the most sense of the language of the Second Amendment and its placement in the Bill of Rights. Uh, the words, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, the court reminded us, uh, echoes language that we find in other constitutional provisions uh, in the Bill of Rights that protect individual rights. Uh, so, for instance, uh, the First Amendment refers to the right of the people to peaceably assemble, which the Supreme Court has held to be an individual right. Uh, the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution refers to the right of the people to be secure uh, in their papers, houses, uh, effects, etc., against unreasonable searches and seizures. Clearly, a right of individuals to be free from unreasonable searches and seizures. The prefatory clause of the Second Amendment, the part that refers to the well-regulated militia, the court said was not in uh, tension with this idea of an individual right to bear arms. In part because the court said that at the time of the framing, when uh, the framers added the Second Amendment to the Constitution, they understood the militia to be effectively we the people, uh, uh, the uh, ordinary people who when called out to serve uh, would go home, grab our guns, and be ready to fight in an instant. Hence the Minutemen of, um, uh, of Revolutionary Era fame. And so the court held that the Second Amendment protects a right of individuals uh, to have guns uh, and not a, a right that's merely restricted to service in state militias or a federalism provision to protect against federal overreaching uh, with regards to the militia. Um, at the same time, the Supreme Court in the Heller case did say that there's plenty of room under the Second Amendment for uh, effective gun control laws. Uh, the court said in an important passage in the Heller case uh, that nothing in the opinion should be taken to cast doubt on longstanding laws uh, that uh, bar felons and the mentally ill from having firearms, that bar guns from sensitive places like um, government buildings and schools, uh, nor should anything in the opinion be taken to cast doubt upon commercial sale restrictions of firearms. Um, uh, the court also along the way referred to a long history and tradition of restrictions on concealed carry of firearms and suggested that firearms like machine guns that might be thought to be dangerous and unusual, uh, not in common use for lawful purposes, uh, are also subject to restriction. 
And I think that in making this, uh, taking this approach, what I think of as a balanced approach to the Second Amendment, one that does recognize an individual right to bear arms, while at the same time recognizing plenty of room for reasonable and effective gun control laws, the Supreme Court um, in, uh, accurately sort of uh, may put into doctrine, let's say, uh, Second Amendment doctrine, the long history and tradition of gun rights and gun control in America. Because we've had a long tradition of gun rights, even if you're not certain about the Second Amendment, even if you remain confused by James Madison's wording of the Second Amendment, it's clear that in many other ways the right to bear arms has been uh, very well protected in American law. So 43 states currently protect the right of individuals to have guns for personal protection in their state constitutions. Uh, this is not tied to militia service in any way. Uh, these are clear rights to uh, individuals to have guns uh, for their own defense. Uh, courts go dating back to the 1820s have been interpreting those state constitutional provisions uh, and reading those provisions to provide an individual right uh, to bear arms. Um, and we often think today that gun control is a modern 20th century invention uh, and thus might be unconstitutional under the Second Amendment. But in truth, we've had gun regulations since before uh, the founding of America. Uh, in the colonies and in the revolutionary era, the founding fathers had gun laws. They didn't call it gun control, but they barred large portions of the population from having guns portions of the population that they thought to be untrustworthy. Not only the obvious cases, like slaves and free blacks, but also law-abiding white people in some circumstances, namely loyalists. Um, people who refused to swear an oath of loyalty to the revolution were subject uh, to disarmament. Uh, and we're not talking about traitors here. We're not talking about people who are fighting for the British. We're talking about what historians estimate to be about 40% of the American people who thought that these 13 disorganized colonies taken on the, most, uh, uh, the strongest military power in the world at the time was a huge mistake that would result in quite a few hangings. Um, and, uh, and so they were subject to disarmament. The Founding Fathers also had had safe storage laws that applied to gunpowder. You had to store gunpowder in a special way. And the city of Boston even had a law that uh, barred, the, bar, barred keeping any loaded weapon in any dwelling, any house, warehouse, business, or otherwise. Um, uh, founding fathers also had extensive militia laws where they imposed upon uh, at least some gun, gun owners, mostly male gun owners between the eight, ages of 18 and 45, the obligation to show up at mandatory musters where they and their guns would be inspected and even registered on public rolls. And there's even some evidence that in some colonies, uh, government officials went door to door to create a registry of the firearms in the community uh, so that they would know where those guns are should those guns be needed to fight off the British or native tribes or other hostile uh, invaders. And indeed, throughout American history, we've had uh, gun regulation. The Founding Fathers didn't see the Second Amendment as creating a libertarian license for anyone to have any gun anywhere they wanted, and thought that gun rights should be balanced with their sense of what was necessary for public safety. And indeed, I think that's been part of the story of guns throughout American history. If you go and look at something like the Wild West, uh, the heart of America's gun culture, where our images of gunslingers walking through town with six shooters on each hip and uh, a rifle in their arm, ammunition strapped across their chest, they probably have a little Derringer pistol hidden beneath their pant leg. You know, they're so loaded down with iron, it's amazing they could even get on a horse, right? Um, but that's our image of the Wild West and these gunfights uh, night and day. Uh, and the truth is, is uh, that, that the Wild West was uh, a much more nuanced and complicated place. And in fact, uh, the frontier towns out in the Wild West, places like Dodge City, Kansas, Tombstone, Arizona, um, or Deadwood, South Dakota, these places had the most restrictive gun control laws in the nation. Um, uh, when Dodge City first formed their municipal government in 1872, uh, the very first law they passed was a ban on carrying concealed firearms. Uh, it was expanded a few years later to ban the open carrying of firearms as well. And in fact, if you went into Dodge City uh, in uh, the late 1870s, you'll see I have this photograph in my book. You won't be able to see it so well. Uh, I could have done a nice um, uh, presentation like Eugene does, but you know. He's much more technologically savvy, you know, graduating college at 15, and you know, I still haven't, I still haven't gotten out of school. So, um, 
but uh, I've got this great picture in the book, uh, and you'll get a, maybe get a chance to look at it before you go out. Uh, it's a picture of the main street in Dodge City, Kansas, this famous gun haven, um, and well, it looks exactly like what you'd expect a Wild West town to look like, which is a wide, dusty road, brick and clapboard building, uh, a little horse tie in front of the saloon. What you're not expecting is to find this sign that's smack in the middle of the road, and it says, the carrying of firearms strictly prohibited. And this is what you saw when you came into this Wild West town, and you had to check your guns uh, with the marshal, uh, the way you might check your overcoat in a w restaurant in the winter. Oh wait, this is Los Angeles. You don't check your, rest, your, your overcoat in a restaurant in the winter. Um, and you'd get a little token and uh, you'd be able to reclaim your firearm. And actually gun violence in the Wild West frontier towns was actually much more rare than we're let, we've been led to believe. These Wild West towns averaged less than two murders a year. Um, and indeed in most years in the Wild West period from 1870 roughly to 1890, 1895, these towns had zero murders in, uh, uh, in most years. So um, gun violence was a, was a much more complicated scene than, than what we're told. One of the things that I, ha I did discover in doing my research for my book, Gunfight, was that perhaps one of the most disturbing aspects of gun control is the way in which gun control laws have been used historically to maintain the second class citizenship of African Americans and other racial minorities. Um, so we've had a long history and tradition, unfortunately, of racist gun control laws. Not only did the founding fathers have laws that banned slaves and free blacks from possessing firearms, um, but uh, I think that those laws have in many ways continued into the 20th century. Um, and in fact, uh, California uh, adopted in the 1960s, California and the federal government moved to he more heavily regulate guns in part because of fear of African Americans with guns. Uh, in California, it was the Black Panthers. The Black Panthers started roaming around Oakland with loaded firearms. Huey Newton, one of the two founders of the Black Panthers, along with Bobby Seale, had actually done a year at law school and discovered that you can openly carry a firearm uh, on city streets, even without a permit, so long as you didn't point it at anybody. If you let pointed it straight up in the air, straight down in the ground, what the law deemed to be a non-threatening manner, you could do so. And so the Black Panthers used this right to go follow police officers in Oakland to make sure that the police officers wouldn't abuse African Americans. Uh, and uh, as you can imagine, uh, the police officers in Oakland didn't really like this very much uh, and uh, pushed their, law, their uh, allies in the California State Legislature uh, to uh, ban the open carry of loaded firearms in California's cities. These laws were supported by Democrats and Republicans alike. In fact, Ronald Reagan, who was governor of the state of California at the time, made a speech uh, out in front of uh, the California State Capitol in Sacramento uh, one day where uh, he, in 1967, where he said, there's no reason why on the streets today people should be carrying loaded weapons. Um, uh, and so that's part of the unfortunate history of uh, gun control in America, too. Uh, it's race-based aspects. Um, one thing I was also surprising in doing my research and looking back at the history is that the NRA was not always the diehard opponent of gun control that we know it to be today. Um, the NRA in the 1920s and the 1930s helped draft restrictive laws to limit people's ability to carry concealed weapons and to only allow concealed carry when you had a permit uh, and the permit was only allowed, was only, uh, you were only eligible for the permit if you had a good and substantial reason uh, and a good moral character uh, in order to get one. Uh, and uh, these laws were, uh, again, often used against racial minorities. Martin Luther King applied for a uh, concealed carry permit uh, in uh, Alabama after his house had been firebombed, uh, and he was turned down because he did not have a good self-defense reason to have that firearm. Uh, I think actually the problem was that he was black, and that's why he couldn't have the firearm. Um, uh, and so there is a complicated history with gun control laws in America. And just because there's some race-based gun control laws in America does not mean that we shouldn't have gun control. Um, we've had race-based marriage laws, and yet we still have marriage laws and should have them. We've had race-based property laws, and yet we should still have property laws, even though they have uh, a, a, a tainted history. The same thing, I think, holds for gun control laws. Um, now, in today's debate over the reforms that we should might take up that, we, that Congress is considering in the wake of Newtown, we've w w once again heard that uh, these provisions, these proposals are infringements on the Second Amendment. Uh, there's basically three major proposals that have been talked about a lot, uh, universal background checks, uh, restriction on high-capacity magazines, 
restriction on assault weapons. Um, and uh, we've heard often that these are likely to be infringements of the Second Amendment. I think that's not accurate. I don't think any of these laws are likely to be struck down by, if they were to be passed, that's a big if, um, likely to be struck down by the federal courts or by the Supreme Court should they be passed. It's not to say there's not constitutional arguments that could be made against them. I just don't think any of them are likely uh, to be declared unconstitutional. Take, for instance, universal background checks. The Supreme Court has said in the Heller case that nothing in the opinion was designed to cast doubt on uh, laws that restrict access to guns by felons and the mentally ill. Well, background checks are indeed designed to provide a prophylactic rule to prevent felons and the mentally ill, prohibited purchasers of firearms, from getting their hands on firearms through uh, private sales or uh, other mechanisms, uh, other sales like at gun shows, uh, private sales at gun shows where you might not have uh, a background check conducted. Um, uh, restriction on uh, assault weapons is a little bit, I think it's a closer call. The Supreme Court in the Heller case said that, uh, um, that the Second Amendment protects arms that are in common use for lawful purposes. Assault weapons are very commonplace, right? There are millions of these assault weapons out there. They're basically uh, military-style ri rifles is what they're called. Uh, the definition of them is a little hazy. They're basically semi-automatic firearms, generally rifles, that have a detachable magazine and one or more military-style feature like a pistol grip or a folding buttstock. Uh, so, uh, something like that. Um, and these firearms are in, quite commonplace in, in America. But the one federal court of appeals to rule on the constitutionality of an assault weapons ban since the Heller case, the DC Circuit Court of Appeals, in a decision by a well-known conservative judge by the name of Doug Ginsburg, who's known actually for his libertarian leanings of all things, um, uh, upheld the ban on assault weapons, uh, assault rifles in that case, saying that while they may be in common use, um, a restriction on these weapons does not substantially interfere with anyone's ability uh, uh, to defend themselves with a firearm. Uh, indeed, not even with a semi-automatic rifle with a detachable magazine, um, because you, while you can't buy one that had a pistol grip, you could buy the exact same weapon without a pistol grip. Um, and so it wasn't a serious impediment on anyone's self-defense. The court said the same thing about the restriction on high-capacity magazines. These high-capacity magazines are in common use, but restrictions on, uh, on them uh, are not generally um, uh, bur very burdensome on self-defense. Most self-defense incidents with a firearm do not involve shooting the firearm at all. Uh, and uh, of the minority that do involve shooting the firearm, um, only a tiny fraction involve shooting the firearm uh, more than two or three times. Uh, so restriction on the capacity of magazines to 10 rounds, uh, probably not uh, likely to be uh, invalidated. I should say that in part of the reason why these courts are upholding these laws is because my colleague up here uh, on the on the stage wrote a very influential law review article that's been cited in court after court after court, uh, arguing that uh, even if something might be protected by the Second Amendment generally, uh, that if the law is not um, a substantial burden on anyone's ability to use their firearms for self-defense, uh, then that law is probably not unconstitutional. I don't know if they're all misapplying your uh, approach or not, uh, Eugene, but, uh, uh, but it's become uh, influential, uh, greatly influential. I think there are definitely a lot of policy issues about these proposals uh, that may or uh, may not uh, make them worthwhile. Uh, and uh, for that, I'm happy to turn it over to Eugene. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very pleased with this division of labor. I agree with pretty much everything that uh, uh, that Adam has said about the constitutional and the historical points. I agree that the proposals that we're talking about are likely to be constitutional. I say as much in my article. It uh, doesn't mean that I think they're necessarily sound, but not every bad idea is an unconstitutional idea, even in an area where the where a constitutional right is involved. So I want to talk today about something which my sense is for most people, it's actually what they care about more than they care about the legalisms. And that is, what works? You know, by and large, there are concerns about maintaining an armed citizenry for deterrence of government tyranny, query to what extent that will actually be effective given modern weaponry and modern military organization. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But the bottom line is that much of the debate is, and I think very sensibly so, about self-defense. And I think most of us agree that we 
approve of self-defense, but we'd also like to reduce the murder rate. We'd also like to reduce the crime rate. Uh, and on the one hand, to the extent that there might be some gun regulations that might reduce the, the crime rate, many of us endorse them. Even the NRA, for example, endorses, as I understand it, bans on gun possession by felons. That's a gun control law. Uh, but the theory is, and query whether it's right, I'm not sure whether they work particularly well, but the theory is this makes it somewhat uh, more likely that the dangerous people won't have the guns. On the other hand, I take it even most gun control supporters, if they learned that it turns out that, if they learned, if they concluded that, it, that the laws wouldn't work and may cause more harm than good, might change their views. I think at, at the bottom line is in many respects, for most of us, not all of us, but for most of us, it's about the, the criminological questions in many ways more than about the legal questions. So that's what I want to turn to, to now. So some facts about guns in America. About 40 to 45 percent of all households have a gun. Uh, the number may be less in LA, but it's not as low as many people imagine. Uh, it's pretty high uh, 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 pretty much everywhere. And maybe, a little, uh, maybe, maybe as little as, say, 15 percent to 20 percent maybe in the Northeast. But by and large, probably even in Los Angeles, it's at the very least in the 20 to 30 percent range. About 300 million guns in civilian hands. That's handguns, rifles, and shotguns. There are about 12 and a half thousand intentional gun homicides per year. That's probably about two-thirds of all the homicides uh, in the country. Uh, there are about 17,000 gun suicides per year. Whenever you hear numbers such as 30,000 gun deaths, that's pretty accurate. But it's important to recognize that of those, the, the majority, at this point, the substantial majority, are suicides. Uh, and there are about 600 fatal gun accidents a year. Uh, each is a tragedy. Uh, um, uh, some very small fractions seem especially tragic because they involve kids. That's probably about 50 to 70 per year. Uh, but the bottom line is that's not the bulk. It's not even a substantial fraction of the gun deaths, much less the total accidental deaths in the country. That's a number that, that, that's the kind of thing that people sometimes focus on. Maybe there's something can be done about it, although query how much. Uh, but the bottom line is that, that I don't think should be the tail that wags this particular dog. Serious non-fatal injuries a year as well. 7,000 accidents, 30,000 assaults, 3,600 suicide attempts, about 300,000 non-homicide gun crimes per year. About a quarter of all robberies, about 5% of assaults, very, very few rapes. Interesting fact, for whatever reason, criminals, we think, well, criminals aren't going to comply with the law. Well, obviously they don't. They commit robbery, assault, rape. But for whatever reason, they actually don't use guns, by and large, in a lot of these situations. Maybe some of the laws having to do with the use of guns in crime uh, uh, do indeed, uh, uh, do indeed uh, uh, work in some measure. Hard to tell for sure. Now, the interesting question is how many defensive gun users there are a year? And there are two answers. One is about 80,000. That's from the National Crime Victim Survey, a very reputable source. And it's about 2.5 million. Uh, and that's from, and, uh, from um, uh, the Kleck and Gertz survey, also by two very reputable criminologists. They're generally seen as pro-gun rights criminologists. Koch and Ludwig, more pro-control criminologists, ran a similar survey, and they found a number of about one and a half million per year. Now, they point out there's a limit to what you can learn from surveys. Some fraction of people who answer the phone are going to be lying, are going to be drunk, are going to be crazy. So it's not terribly, terribly reliable. On the other hand, it's kind of the only game in town. Uh, you can't very well just go through police records because police records are not integrated in any particular place. What's more, many defensive users are never reported to the police. Uh, if somebody, uh, uh, let's say, sees a burglar break into the house and takes out a gun and shouts, I've got a gun, the burglar runs away, it's a defensive gun use, and I think a very effective defensive gun use. Some of the time, the person will call the police. Sometimes not. He'll say, you know, what are the chances of them, them catching the guy? And even if he calls the police, he might not mention the defensive gun use. He might worry that maybe the police might think he might, the gun may not be completely legal. Who wants that kind of attention, especially when he doesn't have to say it? And then even if he says it, the police might not record it. So for all of those reasons, it's very hard to figure out what the exact number is. All we know is it's pretty substantial. There's little doubt that it's at least in the tens of thousands per year. But just how many, nobody knows for sure. I should mention, by the way, the high numbers were about 20 years ago when the crime rate was a lot higher than it is now. So it's possible that even today the high numbers would be somewhat lower because fewer crimes, less need for defensive gun use.
Some facts about the important gun laws in America. Home possession of rifle and shotguns has been basically legal everywhere, pretty much at all, at all times. Home possession of handguns was legal almost everywhere except Chicago and DC. Apparently it was kind of a hassle in New York and Massachusetts, but even there was legal. Now it's legal everywhere given Supreme Court decisions. So when it comes to possession of guns in the home, very, very broadly legal. Uh, this is a map of what the rule was in 1986 uh, of, oops, sorry, uh, uh, it's a little too animated. I need, need to get back to it to, um, in a moment. Uh, about concealed carry, because this is possession in the home. And that to many people is important for self-defense, as well as for gun controllers, it is criminogenic, because a gun in the home could be used to commit a crime in the home or could be taken from the home to commit a crime elsewhere. On the other hand, for many people, what they really want is to be able to defend themselves not in their home, which is in a safe part of town with a nice alarm, but they want to defend themselves in public. And conversely, many of the gun controllers say, you know, we can't do anything about home possession, but at least we can restrict possession in public. So, so 90, this, is a, this is the map, with yellow being the, uh, the what, what I'm about to show you, and unfortunately moves a little quickly, is yellow is the states in which, uh, uh, in which uh, basic, excuse me, red are the states in which there are no, um, no rights to carry concealed weapons in public. Maybe openly, but that's not a practical matter in most places. Um, uh, so that was red. Yellow is it's discretionary. It's up to the sheriff or the police chief to decide whether to give you a license. Blue is so-called shell issue. It means anybody uh, is entitled to, to get a, a, a license to carry concealed, uh, assuming they're a law-abiding adult, often above age 21. And green is you don't even need a license. So this is what it was in 1986. Note the only green state, Vermont, that notorious gun state of Vermont. Turns out it is. So this is the untold, in many respects, story of gun laws in the last, uh, uh, in the last uh, 25 years. It's a story of gun decontrol. And a, a decontrol not in small matters such as assault weapons bans, which I think are ultimately quite peripheral, uh, but rather of very substantial matters, uh, which is the right to carry uh, weapons with you in public places for self-defense. Uh, so this is where the map is right now. Uh, there are 37 states that are shall issue, three which are unrestricted. You don't even need a license. I believe since I made up this map, Wyoming changed the unrestricted category. And then, and then basically 10 where licenses are very hard to get or just not available at all. That's an important story. Uh, the other interesting thing is we don't have... Uh, we have a lot of controversy about what happened when shall issue laws became popular. Because this, this was a natural experiment in some respects. You could say, well, look, these states changed all these laws over the span of some years, some earlier, some later. Let's see what that did to the crime rate. And John Lott has this more guns, less crime thesis, which is that the increase in private possession of guns decreased crime, decreased at least violent crime, and increased in some measure property crime because of a deterrent effect because criminals know, knew that they're more likely to uh, come up against armed defenders. And in fact, there is some evidence from a previous study of criminals that criminals actually worry a lot about getting shot by the victims. In some respects, more, or at least as much as they worry about getting shot by the police. Uh, then there's the more guns, more crime thesis based on the same data by, I think, uh, Donahue. Um, uh, that says, uh, well, no, if you really analyze the data the right way, it turns out there's a slight increase. But the interesting thing is that the, both the decrease and the increase, to the extent that they have been claimed, have been very slight. And one of the interesting phenomena is a lot of people said there'd be blood in the streets, every fender bender would turn into a shootout. That pretty clearly didn't happen either. So it's a story that, is, that suggests certainly nothing horrible happens when shell issue laws are enacted. I'm not sure anything terribly wonderful happens. I think the jury's still out on that. But the fact remains that the, the interesting story of the last 25 years has been a story of gun decontrol. Now, let me turn a little bit from the data to kind of a way of, ways of thinking about the data. The, it's important when you try to figure these things out to ask the right question. Because a lot of times people ask the wrong question. So the important question to ask is, what are the costs and benefits of a proposed policy? So if you're talking about a gun ban, what are the costs of the gun ban? And what are the benefits? What's the upside and what's the downside? Now, a lot of times people say, what are the costs and benefits of the regulated activity? They say, well, guns are harmful for society. Therefore, if we ban guns, that'll be an improvement. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. For example, it may be that guns are harmful to society because they are disproportionately used by criminals. 
But if you ban guns, that will affect the criminal uses, but not the non-criminal uses. You might have a situation where the regulated activity is harmful, but the ban is more harmful still. Uh, careful listeners might recognize that this is a standard account of prohibition. There's a, was a perfectly plausible story that alcohol on balance is bad for society, even perhaps despite the, of what I'm told now are pretty incontrovertible, heart health benefits uh, uh, of alcohol, uh, that the, the data does suggest that, the, that it may be that alcohol is imbalanced beneficial, but it surely is harmful in lots of ways. Drunk driving, uh, drunk killing, I mean, uh, a lot of homicides are alcohol involved, uh, uh, people getting addicted, people losing their jobs, people killing themselves, essentially poisoning themselves with alcohol. Huge, but at least the conventional wisdom, and I think probably correct about prohibition, is that banning it did more harm than good. Because people were focused on demon rom, people were talking about how bad the thing is, without recognizing that the real question is how good or bad will the ban on the thing be. Likewise, the question isn't, would we be better off in a blank free world? People say, well, we should strive for a gun-free America. You're not going to get a gun-free America. There are 300 million guns in America. You're not going to get a gun-free America. You might get an America in which some people have fewer guns. The question is, is that going to be a better America? Just like you're not going to get an alcohol-free America. You've been trying to get an alcohol-free America. Maybe you'll get a more rum-runner-full America and a more alcohol, uh, uh, illegal alcohol market-full uh, uh, America, as may be, in fact, the case with regard to drug policy as well. So that's the right question to ask. Um, second thing you need to do is you need to distinguish correlation and causation. These are two, two uh, uh, lines, which I think we'll agree are pretty closely correlated. In fact, if, uh, if you, run through, if you put the, run through the tabular data, correlation is about 0.8, very high. Uh, the solid line is the forcible rape rate, and the dotted line is ice cream production. Uh, so you laugh because you think, well, that's pretty unlikely that one causes the other, or the other causes the first. Uh, and I'm sure that's right. What may be the case is what causes things is during the hot months, People commit more sex crimes for a variety of reasons. Maybe more people are in public. During the hot months, people eat more ice cream. So there's some other thing that's causing them. The important thing is if somebody were to say, well, we see this correlation. We certainly want to reduce sex crimes. Therefore, we should ban ice cream. The answer is, well, we need to distinguish correlation from causation. That's a very obvious thing to say uh, at, at this point. But, uh, but a lot of times, people miss the obvious. And this is one particular thing they often miss. Another thing you need to do is consider substitution effects. So for example, at one point there was this big debate about Saturday night special bands. Saturday night specials were cheap, small, mostly low caliber handguns. And the argument was, let's ban the Saturday night specials. After all, law-abiding citizens could still have their good solid 38s. But this is supposedly the criminal's weapon of choice. Turned out it wasn't the criminal's weapon of choice. Criminals liked the good guns just as much as ordinary citizens did. But that was the theory. The trouble is, that what would criminals who would have committed those crimes do? The naive view is they won't commit gun crimes. Uh, I had a Saturday night special, now it's illegal, I'm not going to commit the crime. The less naive view, well, some won't comply with the SNS ban, but the others perhaps won't commit gun crimes. So I have my Saturday night special, maybe I'll, I'll risk it, but criminal Adam over there is going to say, well, no, I don't want to get arrested for possessing the gun, so I'm just going to get rid of it and not commit gun crimes. The sound review is some won't comply with the ban. So in other words, they'll just keep doing what they've been doing before. Some won't commit gun crimes, and some would switch to other guns, which might be more lethal. Somebody might say, well, I can't have a Saturday night special, this small dinky 22 or 25. I'm going to get a 38 or 45 instead. That's a deadlier gun. Uh, that's substitution effects. You need to think about it. You need to think about the fact that criminals are people with their own, their own drives and their own desires, and they're not going to just comply with the law or even violate the law. They may do something worse than either one of those. Um, interestingly, I think that's one of the things that's likely to be, uh, that, that one of the reasons why I think assault weapons bans, though constitutional, are unsound, because the substitution effects are very powerful. They're actually not as dangerous as here, simply because assault weapons are basically as lethal as other guns. They, assault weapons are very lethal because guns are very lethal. Uh, so what will happen is if e some people will keep their assault weapons, uh, some people will get rid of them and instead get other guns that are just as deadly. Uh, 
That's one reason I think the bans are constitutional, because they don't interfere with people's self-defense. People can have other guns to defend themselves. Uh, but they're also one why, they think, why I think they won't be effective. Another thing you need to do is you need to count the actual behavior, not just the visible behavior, but the actual behavior. So one interesting source of that, which criminologists know about, is that when you look at crime, uh, if you were trying to figure out the actual crime levels, changes in crime are a different story, but for the actual levels, you don't want to look at police data, that's the so-called uniform crime reports, except as to homicide. You want to look at survey data from the National Crime Victimization Survey. Why? As I mentioned, survey data is full of all sorts of possible problems. No doubt it is. But the police data is full of one very big problem, which is about half of crimes, and a lot higher in certain categories, are not reported to the police. So you're not counting actual behavior, you're counting the behavior as it is reported to the police. And sometimes there are distortions because of behavior as is then reported on by the police to the central um, uh, officials. So one thing I sometimes uh, hear is people say, well, you hear about all these, def uh, you talk about all these defensive gun users, how come I never hear, see any newspaper stories about defensive gun users? Because if it bleeds, it leads. And if it doesn't bleed, it doesn't lead. Uh, as I mentioned, imagine that hypothetical story about somebody effectively defending himself against a burglar or against a robber with a gun. Uh, maybe the person will not call the police. Maybe he'll call the police and not mention the gun. There's no upside in mentioning the gun in that kind of situation. Maybe he'll mention the gun, but the police won't include it in the police report. Maybe the police will include it in the police report. And here the reporter is sitting there looking at the reports. Oh, there was an attempted burglary, and the burglar was chased off. We don't know anything about the burglar. Nothing was stolen. I mean, maybe in a small town, that is the kind of story that makes the, the front page. In the LA Times, it's not going to. So the problem is, this is reporting bias. And I don't mean reporting bias in some ideological sense, it's just this, in the sense that the decisions use it. That, this, that, that what we're seeing in the reports are, is biased by the judgments about what is newsworthy and what is not, and by the information that the reporter uh, knows in the first place. Another thing you need to do is you need to disaggregate possible effects. And here's what I mean. Imagine that uh, uh, there's a proposal for a handgun ban. Not very popular these days, just politically, because they've been proven to be losers, and of course today they would be unconstitutional. But let's just use it as a simple example. You might say, well, how will a handgun ban affect crime and death? I think it's actually more important to ask how it'll affect different categories of things. For example, gun accidents. A handgun ban might diminish gun accidents by some considerable amount because rifles and shotguns aren't, probably aren't as likely to, to uh, be the, involved in accidents because it's harder to shoot yourself with a rifle or shotgun and a lot of accidents are, uh, are uh, people shooting themselves. Um, uh, what's more, because a lot of the gun accidents involve law-abiding people, they may in fact follow the gun laws and actually comply with the ban. So it might diminish that. Will have no effect at all on gun suicide. Uh, at least no material effect. Maybe it'll slightly increase them, hard to tell. If somebody wants to commit, a suicide, uh, commit suicide, they could just as easily do it with a shotgun or a rifle. Shotgun is generally the preferred weapon for people who don't, uh, who don't commit uh, uh, suicide with a, with a handgun. Uh, and it's not, like some, it's not like concealability, for example, is important uh, uh, for suicides. There's really no way in which it will have any effect on suicides. How about gun homicides and crimes at the home? In the home, again, no effect because people who presumably aren't allowed to possess handguns, they're not going to say, "Well, in that case, I won't have a gun." Chances are they're going to possess a shotgun. If anything, gun homicides and, and domestic violence may actually become high. Uh, excuse me, gun homicides may come, become higher, domestic violence become deadlier because by shifting from handguns to shotguns, you're shifting from a less deadly weapon, about 15% of all assault wounds with a handgun are deadly, to a more deadly weapon, probably about 50 to 60% of all assault wounds with a shotgun are deadly. Gun homicides and crimes in public? Well, their concealability matters. And by small-time criminals, maybe it'll affect it in some measure. Because, after all, small-time criminals might be ones who will say, you know, I'm not willing to risk the extra penalty uh, for my petty burglaries or car thefts, the extra penalty that might accompany my committing them with a crime. By serious criminals, probably, probably not. To them, the handgun is a tool of the trade. They're going to need to use it. By mass shooters, not at all. 
Somebody who is willing to commit uh, mass murder isn't going to much care uh, about the law, but even if he somehow can't get a handgun, he'll get the rifle, he'll get the shotgun, he'll find some way of carrying it around, even if, even if not in a, in a holster under the jacket, but some way they won't be caught in the few minutes it takes him uh, to, to go to the place where he's doing the shooting. And of course, it'll also affect homicides and crimes averted by defensive users. Won't affect them that much at home, although it may affect them some, uh, will affect them quite a bit in public. So the important thing is not just to ask the top question, uh, not just to ask it uh, 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 by itself. Ask it for each of these categories because the effect could be very, very different. Uh, so I'm, I think I'm coming to near the end of my, of my time. Let me just uh, mention a couple of things. This is the best data we have, although it's really very weak data for reasons I'll mention in a moment, as to whether guns are effective for self-defense. Uh, so sometimes you hear stories about, well, in fact, if you're being attacked or robbed, you, you're better off not defending yourself than trying to defend yourself. And it turns out that that is true in the aggregate. So yellow is no defense, blue is uh, include, uh, yellow is the rate of injury of the defender. When, he do, when the defender doesn't defend himself or herself, blue is the one they do. But it turns out that if you disaggregate and ask about gun defenses, it turns out that while defending generally increases the risk of injury, defending with a gun decreases the risk of injury. Uh, now, I said it's weak data, and it's weak data because it's correlation data. It may be that something else is causing those things. So for example, maybe somebody who has the element of surprise, or excuse me, somebody who isn't being surprised, so in other words has maybe surprise on his side, can both use the gun in self-defense and decrease the risk of injury. Maybe that's what's driving it. Hard to tell. But that's the best data, the only data we've got. The other way of thinking about it is the question that I ask people is, what would they rather put on their lawn? Protected by armed patrol or protected by unarmed patrol? <laughs> Interestingly, I've never seen that last sign. That might be telling itself. Um, let me just close with a couple more little uh, data slides. One is who are the gun killers? Because that's an important question. If you think most gun killers are people who are just ordinary law-abiding citizens, who just snap at some point, then maybe serious gun bans, maybe a total handgun ban or total ban at all, altogether if, if it's politically feasible, might actually have some substantial effect on gun homicides. Because those people will comply with the law at their decision point as to whether to get a gun, and then, when they, are, when they snap and get into a killing mood, then they won't have the gun handed. On the other hand, if you think these are people who are generally not law-abiding in general because they're committing murder for much the same reasons that they're willing to commit other crimes as well, then it seems pretty likely they're going to commit gun law violations too. Turns out about 80% of murder arrestees have adult arrest records. So some, fraction, some remaining fraction have juvenile arrest records, especially about 6 to 8% of murder arrestees are juveniles, so they haven't had time to have adult arrest records. 70% of adult conviction records. These include misdemeanors as well as, uh, uh, as well as felonies, but still it's pretty likely that those people aren't going to comply with gun laws just as they're not complying with murder laws. And this is especially so with regard to robberies and other crimes that are seen as less impulsive. Well, the last thing I want to talk about is comparative evidence, because for many people, for many gun control supporters, I think this is what's really important. They say, look, America has a very high level of gun ownership, very high homicide rates. Japan and England have low levels of gun ownership, low homicide rates. That's pretty telling, they say. Uh, and some other countries, too, they, the, is, is the argument. So here's the data. So Kelia Saral, who I think nobody would deny uh, are pro-gun control uh, criminologists. They ran a study of 21 countries uh, about 10 years ago. And it turns out there was, even in their study, there was no statistically significant correlation between gun ownership and total suicide, homicide, assault, or robbery. There were some high gun, high death countries, some high gun, low death, low gun, high death, low gun, low death. And those, aren't, and those countries were relatively Western countries. Now, they did find there was some correlation for suicide with a gun, homicide with a gun, but only of women, assault with a gun, and robbery with a gun, but I don't think that's what matters. So for just for suicide and homicide are the clearest examples. Somebody is dead either way, whether it's with a gun or, with, or not. Now, guns are more lethal. So it may be that one of the theories, if you limit guns, what will happen is that some of the, hum, some of the uh, people will still commit homicide with knives, but other people won't commit uh, homicide at all because the knife isn't going to be as deadly. 
But it's also possible that what will happen is if you limit access to guns, the homicide with guns declines, the homicide with knives and other weapons increases because people aren't able to defend themselves against those weapons. Those are both plausible theories. The way you figure out, check those theories is with data. But the data you need to be looking to for that is the total homicide data, or the total suicide data to the extent you care about it, which I don't think you should as much, and not homicide with a gun data. So whenever you see studies that claim to say, oh, well, we did this comparative thing, and the homicide with a gun was more common in gun places with lots of guns, and especially suicide with a gun is more common in places with lots of guns, the question I think you should be asking is, why are you only looking to homicides with guns? Why don't you look at the total dead bodies on the ground? And if those turn out to be pretty similar in those places, it's not clear why trading off one form of death, way of death, dying for another is a worthwhile trade-off. Now, let me just give you some specific data. So this is, as I mentioned, that thing up top is what people worry about. They say 40% gun ownership, 5.4 homicide rate, Hungary, 2.22, 2% gun ownership. Say, so, aha, something's going on. Ooh, Finland, 40%, 2%. Uh, Norway, 36%, 0.81. Uh, and in fact, it has a lower homicide rate than the Netherlands, which has a higher rate with 2% gun ownership, or Poland, higher rate with 2% gun ownership. So then that's further evidence that this maybe correlation that you see as the United States is not causation in part because you don't even see the correlation mirrored elsewhere. That maybe what's going on is there are cultural differences between Norway and the US, or for that matter, Norway and neighbor Finland, which explain why even as to these two, there's a more than twofold difference even though there's very similar gun ownership rate. Um, the last piece of data is the famous Seattle-Vancouver study. And this is about 20 years ago now. Seattle, 11.3 homicides per 100,000 people back then. It's lower now, fortunately. Vancouver, 6.9. Aha! Seattle, Vancouver, very similar, very similar size, very similar wealth, right next to each other. Uh, and on top of that, uh, uh, but, I'm sorry, but Seattle has very liberal gun laws. Vancouver, even back then, had pretty, pretty restricted gun laws. Turns out that if you control for demographics, or at least for demographics among whites, what you see is Seattle homicide rate was 6.2 and Vancouver was 6.4. So virtually identical, even though the gun laws are just as different. Now it turns out, for, among other racial groups, uh, the homicide rate was a lot higher for each group in Vancouver than in Seattle, but that might have something to do with the fact that there may be cultural differences. There may be, for example, race-linked gangs in Seattle that aren't present in Vancouver, or something along those lines. Certainly once you see that, you start wondering whether this is really caused by the difference in gun laws when this, presumably, can't be caused because it's the same regardless of the difference in gun laws. And what's more, if you look at other comparisons, and here I'm fast forwarding to 20 years to 2010 and 2011 data, Manitoba, 3.95 homicides, Saskatchewan, 3.4, Alberta, 2.45, I'm working my way west, British Columbia, 1.85, Minnesota, actually a lot lower than its neighbors to the north, North Dakota, a little lower than at least one of its neighbors to the north, Montana, about the same, and Idaho, lower, uh, and Washington actually somewhat higher than British Columbia. Now, if you look at, for example, Ontario, much, much lower homicide rates than New York and Michigan, which are its neighbors. In the Maritimes, it's closer to this. Uh, but what we're seeing then is there is a difference. There's no doubt that there's a difference that, it's a, that explains why it is that the, that the homicide rate is a lot lower in Ontario than there is that it is in, say, Michigan. It just probably is in gun laws. Otherwise, we'd expect that same difference to play out here, which it doesn't. So with that, I close. I have more slides, maybe for questions and answers. I'm Marshall Buck. I'd like to ask uh, Adam Winkler. You mentioned that uh, Heller indicated that uh, gun control would be acceptable where it was effective. Doesn't this put the onus on the person wanting to control guns to prove that these laws are effective in some way. I should say that that was my own language, my own description of the Heller case and not the actual language in the case. Um, I do think that if we recognize that the right to possess a firearm is a constitutional right, uh, then it does put the burden on the government to justify uh, any restrictions on that right. Um, what we've seen in, there's been a big debate in the federal courts since the Heller court case came down in 2008 about what kind of showing the government must make to defend its laws. Um, 
One view is that the government must come up with very persuasive evidence, including data, to show that any particular law uh, is um, likely to be effective and thus uh, a justifiable burden on someone's right to bear arms. Um, the problem with this is uh, largely in that uh, in most other constitutional rights, we don't require government to have st statistically significant evidence uh, or data uh, and studies to show that uh, a law is going to be uh, effective. Uh, we often allow the government to uh, make uh, assumptions uh, based, on, uh, fact, uh, based on facts that uh, the government believes to be the case, uh, to rely on expert evidence and expert testimony, uh, rather than necessarily have crystal clear proof that something is going to be effective. Part of that is because when we think about legislation, we don't want to say that the government can only legislate in the way that it's legislated in the past. We recognize that the problems we face today on some issues, maybe in guns, maybe not in guns, but in issues more generally, are going to be different than issues we have faced before. We may not have tried or experimented with the underlying law to know whether it's going to be effective or not. Um, and what we've seen in the lower courts so far uh, is a great reluctance to overturn gun control laws uh, on, the basis, uh, on, the, uh, on the basis of the argument that there's insufficient data by the government to support such a law. It's not to say that no courts have done that. Um, there was an uh, important decision out of the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, which uh, covers Illinois and some of the areas of the, some of the states in the Midwest. Uh, in a decision by a well-known federal judge named Richard Posner. Uh, and uh, that case, called Moore against Madigan, decided in December of last year, uh, held that Illinois' complete ban on carrying weapons in public was unconstitutional. Uh, and the court um, looked through the evidence that the government had brought to bear to justify this complete ban on possessing firearms in public uh, and found that that evidence was wanting, that the government had not lived up to its burden of showing that there was good evidence to support this complete ban. I should say that uh, for those of you who are interested in the constitutional issues, uh, the next big question for the Second Amendment is does the right extend outside of the home? So the Supreme Court in the 2008 Heller case that we've mentioned, and in a case in 2010 called McDonald against City of Chicago, uh, ruled that individuals had a right to have a handgun in the home for self-defense, and that there's some language in both of those cases that suggests the right may extend outside of the home, but the court was not forced to decide that in those cases. And so one of the big questions is, does the right to bear arms extend outside of the home? And if so, but what kind of permitting can states put in place? There was a decision just handed down today, uh, the second decision by a federal court of appeals, to say that even though the right might extend outside of the home, states may require a permit to uh, carry a firearm in public and may limit those permits to people who have a good and substantial reason for uh, uh, needing a firearm, such as your, uh, uh, you carry diamonds as part of your job, or you've been threatened, you're being stalked by an identifiable uh, danger, a person who is clearly threatening you, uh, and places can limit concealed carry uh, uh, in those ways and to those circumstances. That would, uh, if those cases go up to the Supreme Court, it'd be very interesting to see what the Supreme Court says. I don't think, I think both Eugene and I probably agree that the Supreme Court is likely to say that the right to bear arms does extend outside of the home. The Second Amendment itself refers to the right to keep and bear arms. Bearing arms is not something you generally do from one room in your house to another. Um, so uh, it probably means you have a right to have a gun in public in some regards. The question really is, is what kind of permitting can states impose and, uh, how many, how, and how restrictive that permitting can be? Cities like Los Angeles and New York uh, and, and other major cities often very seriously restrict who can carry guns in public. My question is for Professor Volok. Given also about the Supreme Court, when the next state gun law is presented to the Supreme Court, how much would you say is a bright line determining how the ruling will go and how much is completely subjective based on what five justices think is reasonable? And will that affect the debate over the next appointment to the Supreme Court, will gun laws be the central issue uh, determining the, the uh, appointment? Well, a lot depends on the particular law that's presented. Uh, 
But I will say that this early in the court's Second Amendment jurisprudence, I do suspect that a lot will turn on the justices' particular views. In areas like the First Amendment, you sometimes see situations where it looks like justices who you'd think would, their, their knee-jerk reaction would be restrict the speech would vote to protect the speech, let's say. Because there's all of this doctrine out there and they've accepted it. Uh, my, that was my thinking about Rehnquist and Hustler v. Falwell. That, that you know, he was a conservative justice, probably thought that this was a very nasty attack by Larry Flint and Jerry Falwell was something he wouldn't mind finding some way of restricting, but the law was what it was and he is willing to go along with it. But really, there have only been two cases in the modern era dealing with the Second Amendment. Both of them have involved the same kind of law, a handgun ban. Neither of them have articulated a specific test for what counts as a permissible speech restriction and what doesn't. Uh, and the consequence is that there's a lot of flexibility to the court. So yeah, it matters a lot. Right now there's a five justice, basically conservative-ish uh, majority. And if, for example, one of the conservatives is retired and replaced with an Obama nominee or a Hillary Clinton nominee or whatever else, then in that case, it would swing the other way. It could be that Heller and McDonald would be overturned altogether, but at the very least, they wouldn't be much extended. I am sure questions would be asked uh, at the hearings, but given the kabuki dance that hearings have become, I think you are not going to get an answer. And I don't think anybody is going to vote against the president's nominee just because they disagree with what they expect would be the nominee. Excuse me, I shouldn't say anybody. Some people will. I don't think you're going to get enough votes against the president's nominee just because people expect that the nominee will vote a particular way on guns, even if they have a very strong expectation of that. So just imagine, imagine that in 2015, there is a Republican Senate, but say Justice Scalia, let's say, just taking one, the conservative justice is quite old, decides to retire, and President Obama nominates a replacement. Even the conservatives in the Senate, uh, even, uh, let's say it's early 2015, so they know they can't stall indefinitely, aren't going to say, no, we're going to refuse to approve all of President Obama's nominees. They're gonna let one of them through. They may try to find one that doesn't seem that, that far to the left, and President Obama might give them, under those hypo uh, that hypothesis, somebody who's not that far to the left. And then they'll be asked, what do you think about the Second Amendment? They'll say, I can't answer because it might come before me. And everybody will nod. And they'll know that probably, being an Obama nominee, he doesn't have a very broad view of the Second Amendment. Not certainly, but probably. But then it's not going to be enough to vote against him, because if they vote against him for that, they'll have to vote against the next guy and the next guy and the next guy. And they don't feel like doing that. That's, I think, the stories it's going to be. So it matters a lot who wins presidential elections. The, this uh, question is for uh, Mr. Winkler. Uh, you mentioned uh, the um, idea behind the Second Amendment. I'm, I, I'm interested in the historical context. Was there debate at the time? What did the founders mean by well-regulated militia, especially well-regulated? Uh, what was going on at that time, and what was the debate at that time, if you can comment on that? There certainly was not a debate about whether it was um, uh, a communal right of a state to be free from federal interference or an individual right. Uh, we didn't see that debate really arise until much later. Um, in part because I think the Founding Fathers just presumed that individuals um, would ha be able to use firearms and other items for self-defense. Remember, we're talking about a time when there was uh, virtually no police force to protect yourself, where crime, uh, responding to crime, was responding to the hue and cry, you know, that you'd cry out that someone had committed a crime against you and people in the community were expected to respond um, uh, and track down that criminal. Um, and so uh, they didn't really have the debate in quite the same way that we had, and also in part because um, firearms were not nearly as effective for self-defense at the time of the founding era. Um, that's not to say that if you were to be shot by a firearm in the founding era, it wouldn't uh, hurt or kill you, but you could really only shoot it once in self-defense, right? It was very difficult, it, would take, it was time consuming to load a firearm at the time, and so you weren't gonna be able to get off uh, multiple rounds to defend yourself. 
It's not to say guns weren't ever used for self-defense, but they might not nearly have been as, as effective as they are today uh, for self-defense. One thing that the Founding Fathers, we should recognize, uh, is that the Founding Fathers were armed revolutionaries. And part of the story, and I, I tell this in the book too, is about the, uh, about the concern over the seizure of guns that led to, uh, that was part of the spark that led to the American Revolution. That wasn't the heart of the American Revolution, but it was the spark that uh, in many ways ignited the tinders that had already uh, grown quite, um, uh, quite dry. Uh, and indeed, when we, we all learn about Paul Revere's uh, um, uh, night ride. You know, the British are coming, the British are coming. We don't often remember why the British were going to Lexington and Concord. It's because that's where the arsenal and store of guns was. Uh, and so part of that story was the British are coming and they're coming to get the guns that we need to defend ourselves against the British uh, and their tyrannical rule. Um, with regards to what, the, what, the, what they meant by well-regulated militia, this has been the subject of some debate and it's not crystal clear from the historical evidence exactly what they meant. Um, they often use the term uh, regulars or regulate uh, in terms uh, only to refer to training and discipline. And there's many in the gun rights community who argue that the well-regulated militia is just one that's subject to training and discipline and not regulated in the way that we regulate firearms today with background checks and, uh, and things like that, uh, restrictions on where you could carry them and whatnot. I think that, that there's, some, there's, there's certainly some evidence in the historical record for that. We should also recognize, however, that the Constitution does, does, use, the words, uh, does use the word regulate in, in a way to be much more expansive than just training and discipline. Uh, so uh, Congress has the power to regulate commerce among the several states. No one ever thought that meant just to train and discipline commerce among the several states, but it was a power to regulate uh, uh, as we understand that terminology. So there's different views on what they meant by a well-regulated militia. Um, I'm not an originalist by, my, by nature. I think uh, that the Constitution does change and evolve in a variety of ways. I think that uh, it doesn't mean the Constitution should mean whatever I think it means. Uh, but I do think that uh, in some ways we can think of the Second Amendment as having that nice balance, a balance between uh, the militia, we the people have a right to keep and bear arms, but uh, we're subject to regulation. Uh, and that being well regulated is an appropriate um, as, uh, to well regulate us is an appropriate uh, function of government to make sure that we handle our firearms in a way that's safe uh, and effective and minimizes the public dangers. But that's my own idiosyncratic view, perhaps. If I can just add a little bit, I actually agree with, with pretty much everything that Adam said. But um, So m the best explanation that I've seen of what well regulated means is that regulated meant governed by rule. Regulate commerce was, was a term used to take commerce and subject it to laws that are conducive to the proper flourishing of commerce, which may in fact include prohibitions on certain things at times. To have a well-regulated militia would be a militia that is well-disciplined, well-trained, subject to rules about that you have to show up, you have to keep your guns in good order, you have to follow orders and the like. Well-regulated modifies militia. It doesn't modify gun ownership. So the framers contemplated that the militia, which was the armed citizenry, armed male citizenry, uh, 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 would, be, um, uh, would be properly governed by rule, properly trained in its capacity as militia. There was room for regulation, but it didn't come of, the, of, the, uh, of gun ownership uh, and gun use and gun possession, but it didn't come from well-regulated militia. It came from the word right that the framers did not view rights as being as unlimited as the text suggests. They viewed rights as something that's subject to some general control. Uh, and that's why it, most courts during the, uh, eight, during the 1800s, when they confronted bans on concealed carry, which required people to openly carry, in a context where it usually didn't involve constitutional provisions that mentioned well regulated, nonetheless upheld the bans because they said this is not a prohibition of carrying guns, it is merely a regulation of carrying guns. That was understood just because, just like free speech was understood as a very broad free press, very broad important right, but not unlimited. So yeah, I think if you look at it as an originalist matter, I don't think that, uh, 
uh, that the framers understood the right as being an unlimited right. I just think that that's because they didn't understand any rights to be unlimited. Uh, and the well-regulated part is, n is not where the home of the authorization of such regulations is. Yes, <clears throat> my question is around statistics. Uh, you, you displayed, or I've, I've seen written a statistic that one country, Switzerland, yeah. uh, gives everyone a gun and also gives training on the proper use of mm -hmm. that gun, and they have one of the lowest gun violence uh, ratios. Is there, is there, has there been any studies done? First, I don't, first of all, is it true? And second, is there any studies done to tie training along with possession and, and being effective in control? Well, so I've heard multiple things about Swiss law. I haven't tried to carefully uh, focus on it. It is clear that Switzerland takes the militia view that the framers took. The first militia act as, uh, of 1792, as Adam pointed out, required everybody to show up and muster their own guns. As I understand, the Swiss require every man to be a member of the military and to show up once a year for fairly extended training, and as I understand it, they have to have a machine gun uh, hanging on their wall or somewhere in their house, and they are issued a certain amount of ammunition. And I'm also told that they're required to account for the specific, that specific ammunition. It's not something you're just supposed to go out there and use, although you are supposed to periodically go and, and practice and train target shooting. Uh, so, and also Switzerland does have a very low homicide rate. I'm very hesitant to infer much about that, just because, first of all, for the same reasons that I mentioned here, uh, with regard to the uh, with regard to the international comparisons, you know, uh, Norway doesn't do that, as best I can tell, and yet it has a pretty low homicide rate. I don't think that Swiss homicide rate is any lower. Uh, conversely, you've got uh, uh, you've got countries out there that uh, have uh, high gun ownership, and they do have high homicide rates like the US and there are others too. Um, so, so I think a lot of it turns on culture. The second problem is that the problem of gun violence in America is not a problem of bad training. In fact, if people were better trained, maybe they'd shoot straighter and there'd be more gun homicides. Uh, the, the problem is, in considerable measure, a problem of, of gangs and other career criminals. In some measure, it's a problem of people uh, who have always been kind of on the borderline of the law misusing guns. Very little of it is a problem that they haven't been properly trained. So maybe better training would reduce the 600 gun accidents even more, just as better training would reduce the considerably greater number of drownings if we only trained people to swim better. And that could be good, but that's 600. The 12,500 homicides, I don't see what training is going to do about it. Okay, so <clears throat> gangs are a large portion of what you're saying. For Eugene, are gangs are a large uh, causal factor of violence, you, you would suggest. I'm sorry, what are? Gangs. Gangs, gangs. yes. That's my understanding. Have you heard this news story about what happened in Venezuela? Um, shoot. Um, I think it was Venezuela, where um, gangs formed an alliance in, to cease the violence. And then did you hear about the, um, the gangs in South Central LA, they formed a truce um, to uh, eliminate violence and uh, so forth. Um, do you think that that sort of thing can happen on a larger scale? Can we the people uh, organize ourselves uh, to reduce gun violence without um, top-down gun, gun, gun control? Uh, well, first, I don't even trust newspaper articles that I read myself, much less ones that I hear about. Uh, I'm not saying this to fault you. It's just I'm very hesitant to draw much by way of inferences from something I hear. In terms of, of we the people organizing ourselves, the normal way we the people organize ourselves is through laws. I mean, that might be effective, except in this kind of situation, I just don't think it will be because the criminals aren't likely to abide by them. I just don't see what it is that people can do 
to kind of keep criminals from shooting each other, whether those criminals are gang members or whether those criminals are drug runners, which could be gang members too, but could be just more professionalized, or whether those criminals are uh, drug addicts who are just, just not thinking straight, uh, or whether those criminals are just some, guy, some people with, with poor anger management. Uh, so, I, I mean, maybe you have particular proposals, but I just don't see that happening. I will say one way in which people traditionally have operated to reduce violence against themselves is by protecting themselves or often hiring people to protect themselves. In a sense, one of the things that gun possession does is it allows an ordinary citizen to be in the same position as some movie star or some politician who, has, who can afford to hire a... Um, uh, a security guard, and people could be their own security guards. That's far, far from an optimal way of protecting yourself because some of the time you're not paying attention and that could be the time that you're attacked. Uh, but that's the only one that I can think of. Um, just as a, a, a brief addition, there have been some successful programs uh, that largely go under the umbrella of Operation Ceasefire. And they are programs that are very labor and resource intensive, that are outreach programs to involve gang members and important people in their communities uh, um, uh, from uh, local church uh, from local churches and other local leaders uh, and former gang members and they do these interventions uh, and uh, they bring in uh, you know the police and uh, you talk to the LAPD they know who's committing the crimes right they, there's no there's not a big it's not bewildering to them they know which blocks they live on uh, they know which gangs they belong to and they bring these people in and meet with the uh, former gang members uh, and their other community leaders uh, and try to really work with them about uh, reducing tensions among gang communities uh, and whatnot. Uh, so they've been, they've, been, uh, they've been effective in Chicago uh, when it was tried and in Boston when it was tried. Um, the problem is they're very resource uh, and labor intensive. There's not a lot of political will uh, to try these efforts. You know, one of the sad things that we see is that um, you know, in Newtown, when there's a lot of white middle class or upper, upper middle class kids killed, it becomes a big public attention. When it's poor racial minorities or people in uh, lesser circumstances, uh, often there's not the same political will to get involved. But there have been some programs that uh, have been effective, um, uh, at least at, in some initial trial uh, stages uh, that might be promising to reduce that violence because so much of the violence is gang and recidivist criminal, career criminal related. Question for Adam, but Eugene, if you want to jump in afterward, sounds great. Uh, I, I think that our society, certainly federal laws, have been liberalized over the years. You interpret in, dance is a form of speech. Uh, Roe versus Wade gave women certain rights they didn't have before, privacy. Um, and the, the new voting laws where you can't uh, get ID for someone to vote. So what I'm, what's curious to me is how is with all this expansion of rights, of uh, opportunities, that the Second Amendment, which states shall not be infringed, it, it becomes sort of the target of infringement, whereas all these other ones that refer to the people are all very open. Certainly you would not want to require uh, um, a tax to vote, but yet they're com contemplating taxes, uh, new tax, federal taxes on firearms. Mm. So why is this happening? Why are we going in that direction and not the other? Well, I'm, I'm, not, sure, I'm not sure that I agree with the, the premise of the question, that, that it's being, that federal law is um, only focusing on guns and not focusing on restrictions in other areas, or that law generally is doing that. Uh, I think that uh, the voter ID laws, the voter ID laws that we've seen in states, uh, are at least arguably an effort to restrict access to the right to vote uh, by requiring ID uh, that many people won't have. Uh, before they vote. Um, I think if you look at something like you mentioned abortion, um, we've seen over the last 
uh, 15 years, uh, and especially over the last 10, a huge rise in restrictions on women's access to abortion in state after state after state. Um, so I don't think that guns necessarily are unique in this. I think one of the things that we do with the law is we try as a people in a democratic society to impose our preferences on the society. Uh, and uh, that sometimes we do that in ways that I completely object, and sometimes we do it in ways that I think is a good idea. Um, but there hasn't been a tr there hasn't been over the last 20 years a huge growth in federal gun control laws. In fact, since 1994, uh, the only federal gun control law that's been adopted was a very minor uh, record-keeping law after the Virginia Tech massacre uh, to try to improve the federal database on, um, uh, on reporting of mental health uh, adjudications, uh, and most people uh, recognize that that law was widely ineffective, and uh, I think only, I think it's only four states provide complete and accurate information on mental health adjudications to the federal background check system for guns. So. Um, I don't know. I mean, there's certainly there's uh, proposals that have been uh, uh, proposed now within the wake of Newtown, but I think that was because it was such a high-profile event that really did stimulate a lot of uh, public attention and uh, stimulated interest groups on all sides to get involved in this issue. Although I I don't know that it's going to be followed up with any legislation. Uh, it might, um, uh, uh, and I personally would like to see a universal background check adopted uh, um, at the federal level. I don't know for sure that that's going to be adopted, uh, and if I were a betting man, um, uh, and I do like to bet occasionally, um, I'd be betting against it. Um, so I, I don't know. It doesn't seem like the, the Second Amendment would not be the example that I would use of the federal government's uh, recent surge uh, in overbearing legislation. I think more telling was Eugene's map that he had there that went yellow to purple. What we've seen is a, a, a real rise over the last 30 years of more permissive gun laws, not more restrictive gun, gun laws. Uh, again, I agree with pretty much everything that Adam says. Let me just supplement it. First of all, I think what we have been seeing is since the 1960s and since the vast crime surge, now largely eliminated, though not entirely, uh, uh, but since the crime surge of the 1960s, there have been attempts to fight crime. Uh, and we have seen that manifest in gun control laws in some measure, although many of them have been, have been uh, uh, pol politically defeated or even un rolled back in some measure, uh, and also in increased searches and seizures. Uh, there's been uh, cut back uh, on Fourth Amendment rights from what may have been seen as a high watermark in the 60s, perhaps a sound cutback. I'm not, I don't know what the right rule is with regard to the Fourth Amendment, uh, but certainly the Second Amendment is not unique in there being more attempts to regulate the subject matter. If anything, I mean, there's been an increase in Second Amendment protection just because in 1970, most people would have thought that the Supreme, in fact, would be almost certain the Supreme Court would have said no individual right under the Second Amendment. Now it's protected something of the right. So both at the political level and at the judicial level, you've actually seen more protection for gun rights. Uh, but to the extent there have been attempts to restrict them, they've been just because of the concern about crime. Uh, and that's not, that's not in play in some of the examples you give. The other thing is people like to draw analogies between Second Amendment rights and other constitutional rights, and I like to do that in some measure myself. My article talked about it in some measure, but you've got to look at the big picture. So for example, you can't have a tax or, or on voting or charge a fee to vote because there's a specific constitutional amendment that prohibits uh, taxes on voting, the 24th, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. On the other hand, when it comes to speech, you can be charged a modest amount for a demonstration permit. If you want to have a large rally, you need to get a permit, you can be charged for that. How about the right to marry? You gotta pay for a marriage license. Uh, if you have a right to develop your own property, uh, Lucas v. the South Carolina case, the uh, takings case says that, but of course you can be charged a lot for permits to develop the property. There have been restrictions on abortion, excuse me, there have been regulations on abortion clinics that have been challenged on the grounds that they drive up the cost of an abortion. The court said, well, modest extra costs are okay. So really, if you look at the big picture for some of these things, not for all of them, but for some of these things, it turns out that right to bear arms is being treated much the same as other rights, which is to say subject to some degree of regulation, but not, uh, but not general prohibition. In some situations, I think it's not being treated right. But I, but I think the fees example, if the fees are modest enough, is, uh, is not one of them. 
there was a great deal of opposition to the adoption of the Constitution. You get the Federalist Papers because of that. The Second Amendment, when adopted, applied only to the federal government, not to the states. There was no 14th Amendment. I have, in effect, two questions. One, was the state militia looked upon at the time of the adoption of the Second Amendment as an ability to check the federal government, the newly centralized, powerful federal government? And secondly, since initially it did not apply to the states but only to the federal government, would the standard on gun control be different for the federal government than for the states? Could the states be really substantially more restrictive than the federal government could be? Can we take this? Um, well, that's a very good question. It's true. Most people don't realize this, but the Bill of Rights that we take as our, um, as our lodestar of our, our individual liberties was really only designed to limit the federal government and not designed to limit the state and local governments. That's why the First Amendment says Congress shall pass no law. It doesn't say the state of Massachusetts shall not pass any law or that the city of Boston shall not uh, pass any law. But that changed fundamentally after the Civil War. You often hear how the Civil War changed the relationship between the federal and state governments. Well, one of the ways it did that was that the framers of the 14th Amendment wanted to impose the Bill of Rights upon all the states as well, because one of the things that had happened in the pre-war period uh, is that the southern states had restricted not just the rights of African Americans by enslaving them, although obviously that's the most serious infringement of uh, constitutional rights you could imagine, but also restricted access to the mails, right, because abolitionist speech was being spreaded through the mails, uh, and uh, otherwise restricted a lot of uh, people's constitutional rights, uh, even though they were recognized. One of the purposes of the 14th Amendment was to impose the Bill of Rights on the states. And in fact, what happened was, it's actually an interesting story, most people don't realize it, but uh, right after the Civil War, the southern states were determined to take those rights away from blacks that they had earned in that Civil War um, and uh, passed laws like the Black Codes that restricted what African Americans can do, uh, uh, required them to have labor contracts and restricted their movements. One common provision in the Black Codes was that blacks were barred from possessing firearms. Um, uh, white people did not want black people in the South to have firearms, by and large. Uh, and so they passed these rules. One of the purposes of the 14th Amendment was to overturn those black codes. And uh, the Second Amendment uh, and the right of the freedmen to have firearms for personal protection was part of that story. You know, when the black codes were adopted, uh, you know, uh, 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 the white racists in the South found out what gun control advocates have been discovering ever since, which is you could put a law on the books and that doesn't change anyone's behavior. Uh, you have to, sometimes you have to go out and enforce those laws. And in the South, um, who went out to enforce those laws? Well, it was whites would gather together in groups in posses of men that would go out at night in disguise to terrorize black people. This was the birth of the KKK. And in fact, the KKK begins um, with gun control at the very top of its agenda because they have to take those guns away from African Americans. Many African Americans got their hands on guns through service in the Union Army uh, or bought guns on the marketplace that was literally flooded with hundred, the hundreds of thousands of firearms that had been produced for the war. Um, and the framers of the 14th Amendment were very clear and said repeatedly um, that part of the reason why they needed this 14th Amendment was so that the freedmen's right to have guns for personal protection um, uh, would be preserved and applied uh, against the states. It's actually an interesting sort of constitutional uh, dilemma. What if, if you, if you presume that the Second Amendment was not designed to protect an individual right, just assume that for a second, uh, it was only designed to protect state militias against federal interference, what do we do about that Second Amendment when the framers of the 14th Amendment, when they decided to make that amendment applicable against the states through the 14th, they thought the 14th Amendment framers did envision it as an individual right, an individual right of the freedmen to have guns for personal protection. They understood the Second Amendment potentially, at least, differently than the founders. Well, so which right do you protect now? Um, there's two different views of gun rights that might be embedded in the Constitution. It might be an interesting... Uh, one of those things that maybe we only we law professors who deal with the Constitution all the time uh, would find a fascinating little uh, knot to untie.